We continue the story of uh, one of the greatest enemies of the faith, dear friends, because such enemies exist today, and uh, one of these days, some of them might appear on the very uh, world scene, and we are to expect them. We know from Revelation 13 that there are two beasts coming to work in unison against God's truth and against God's people. Uh, interesting question that was uh, that was asked was uh, that uh, in the early Christian tradition, the statements that Simon Magus was going in going through the motions, he seemed to do what everyone else was doing, except that he only pretended to accept Christ as his savior and to really accept Christ to really truly lead him and change him from inside out. The church compared him with Judas Iscariot. <laughs> so in these famous John Chrysostom's statements and preachings, you find that Simon himself, uh, when he saw the signs and wonders which were done without any magic ceremonies, fell into admiration and believed, and was baptized and continued in fasting and prayer. Everyone shall give account of himself, and God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked, for with him it is a constant rule that innocence is never punished. I'm just taking this from the uh, homilies of, of, of John Chrysostom anyway. But it's interesting, it says, For neither did he drown Noah, nor burn up Lot, nor destroy Rahab's company. And if you desire to know how this matter was among us, Judas was one of us, and took the like part of the ministry which he had, and Simon the magician received the seal of the Lord. Yet both the one and the other proved wicked, for former hang himself, and the latter, as he flew in the air in a manner unnatural, was dashed against the earth. Moreover, Noah and his sons were with, were, were, uh, with him, were in the, in the ark, but Ham, who alone was found wicked, received punishment in, in his son. This is allusion to Nimrod. <coughs> Another <coughs> interesting individual from the Old Testament times, who actually introduced into the true religion he introduced sacrifice of children. That's how we have the sacrifices to the sun god Baal and all kinds of other horrible perverted ways. And according to the tradition, it was the, um, it was Shem or Shem's, uh, from whom comes the oldest son Elam. It was Shem who was persecuting Nimrod to kill him because of Satanism, found him in his day of hiding. Uh, called Saturnalia, today's Rome, modern Rome, and kill him in that, on that site. Many people don't even know that, but this is interesting from the tradition, history, brethren, and we should know it. We should know it. Bible history is absolutely amazing, both the true Bible history of the both Old and the New Testament. Now, uh, uh, after Simon was baptized, he continued with Philip, not for the faith's sake, but in order that he might become such as he. But why did Peter and John not correct him instantly? That's the question. Well, they were content with his condemning himself, for this too belonged to their work of teaching. When he had no power to do anything else, he played the hypocrite, just as did the magicians who said, This is the finger of God in Exodus 18, that is Exodus 8, verse 19. In order that he might not be driven away, Therefore, Simon Magus continued with Philip and did not part from him, as the Bible says. Now, in uh, John Chrysostom's homilies, it says, Do you see that it was not done in any ordinary manner, but it, it indeed needed, it needed great power to give the Holy Spirit? For it is not the same to obtain remission of sins and to receive such a power. It was a twofold sign, both the giving to those and the not giving to this man. Whereas Simon ought, on the contrary, to have asked to receive the Holy Spirit, because he did not care for this, he asked power to give it to others. And yet Philip did not receive this power to give. But Simon wished to be more illustrious than Philip, he being among the seventy disciples. Now, what you might have deduced from all of this, brethren, that John Chrysostom pointed out a another similar occurrence that happened to Paul and Barnabas on their first journey while they were on Cyprus at Paphos, a Jewish sorcerer named Bar-Jesus, also called Elimas, 
tried to turn the proconsul Sergius Paulus away from the faith. And when Paul pronounced blindness to the sorcerer, the proconsul believed. Now Chrysostom about that states that, again, a Jewish sorcerer, as was Simon, and observed this man while they preached to the others, he was not bothered, but only when they approached the proconsul. And then regarding the proconsul, the wonder is that although prepossessed by the man's sorcery, he was nevertheless willing to hear the apostles. So it was with the Samaritans. From the competition, the victory appears, the sorcery being defeated. Now, uh, this drawn criticism also pointed out a third similar exp- expression of sorcery that occurred as Paul and Sila and Sila, Silas came to Philippi in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, we have this account on verse, in verse 16 to 24. And it says that a certain damsel was possessed with a spirit of Python. What is this demon? asked John Chrysostom. Well, the god, as they called him Python, from the place he is so called. And the demon wished to bring them into temptation to provoke them. So the demon followed us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High of God, which show unto us the way of salvation. O you accursed one, if then you know that it is his way of salvation that they show, why do you not come out of him freely? But when Simon wished, when he said, Give me that on whosoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit, as he stated in Acts chapter 8, verse 19, the same did this demon. Since he was, he saw them becoming famous, he also played the hypocrite. By this means he thought to be allowed to remain in the body if he should preach the same things. But if Christ did not need to receive testimony from men, as we know from John 5.34, meaning John much less from a demon, praise is not seemly in the mouth of a sinner, for it was not sent him of the Lord, says Ecclesiastic, Ecclesiastes chapter 50 verse 9, much less from a demon. For what they preach is not of men, but of the Holy Spirit. Now another church historian Ambrose stated that Simon had become deprived due to a long history of practice of magic and consequently had no clear consciousness of faith. When Simon, deprived by long practice of magic, had thought he could gain by money the power of conferring the grace of Christ and the infusion of the Holy Spirit, We see that Peter, by his apostolic authority, condemns him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit through magic vanity, and all the more because he had not the clear consciousness of faith. And yet Peter did not exclude him from the hope of forgiveness, for he called him to repentance. Another church historian, Tertullian, probably a little bit more known, he stated that magic and astrology, such as Simon practice, was a form of idolatry and was taught to men by the fallen angels. Of course, that would be by demons. And yes, I would, I would, I would uh, be prone to think that one as well. Now, uh, we already talked about how Simon tried to purchase the, the Holy Spirit. Now I've just reviewed some of these, uh, uh, comments about him by the, uh, by the early church historians. And now, we can perhaps address the issue of Simon's baptism. Regarding Simon's baptism, Cyril of Jerusalem stated that he came for baptism in hypocrisy to spy out what the faithful were doing and was therefore condemned. This was a characteristic of later heretics too. Even Simon Magus once came to the lever in Acts chapter 8 verse 13. He was baptized and he was not enlightened. Though he dipped his body in water, he enlightened not his spirit with the spirit. His body went down and came up, but his soul was not buried with Christ, nor raised with him, as we know from Romans 6 chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 2 verse 12. Now I mention the statements of men's falls that you may not fall, for these things happen to them by way of, ex- for, of example, and they were written for the admonition of those who to this day draw near. Uh, the admonition of that is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. In Hebrews 12 verse 15, 
Let none of you be found tempting his grace, lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, says Hebrews 12.15. So let none of you enter saying, let us see what the faithful are doing. Let me go in and see that I may learn what is being done. Do you expect to see and not expect to be seen? And do you think that while you are searching out what is going on, God is not searching your heart? But perhaps, perhaps, perhaps there is among you some hypocrite, a man pleaser, and one who makes a pretense of piety, but believes not from the heart, having the hypocrisy of Simon Magus. This is another, uh, another homily of Cyril of Jerusalem, his prologue to the catechetical lectures. One who has come in, not in order to receive of grace, but to spy out what is given, let him also learn from John. And now also the axe is laid to the roots of this, of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bring good forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is written in Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. So the judge is unyielding. Uh, put away your hypocrisy, says another homily. Beware, lest, lest like Simon, you come to the dispensers of baptism and hypocrisy while your heart is not seeking the truth. Uh, for he is present in readiness to seal your soul, and he shall give you that seal at which evil spirits tremble, the heavenly and sacred seal, as also it is written, in whom also you believed and were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Now, why was Simon the sorcerer condemned? Was it not that he came to the apostles and said, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit, as he stated in Acts chapter 8, verse 19. For he said not, you know, give me the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, but give me the power that he might sell to others that which could not be sold, and which he did not himself possess. Is he, he offered money to them, to them who had no possessions, I mean the apostles, and this, though he saw men bringing the prices of the things sold, and laying them at the apostles' feet, <laughs> he didn't, however, consider that they who trod underfoot the wealth which was brought for the maintenance of the poor, were not likely to give the power of the Holy Spirit for a bribe. But what did they say to Simon? Your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money that we read in Acts chapter 8 verse 20. For you are a second Judas for expecting to buy the grace of the Spirit with money. <laughs> now, uh, for the heretics, and this is again from the preaching of Cyril of Jerusalem, Catechetical Lectures, uh, chapter 16 and paragraph 6, uh, announced it, and it says, For the heretics who are most profane in all things have sharpened their tongue, Psalm 140 verse 3, against the Holy Spirit also, and have dared to utter impious things. As Irenaeus the interpreter was has written in his injunctions against heresies, for some of them have dared to say that they were themselves the Holy Spirit, of whom the first was Simon the sorcerer, spoken of in Acts. For when he was cast out, he taught such doctrines. And they who are called Gnostics, impious men, have spoken other things against the Spirit. And the wicked Valentinians, something else. And the profane Manes, dare to call himself the Paracletus sent by Christ. Others, again, have taught that the Spirit is different in the Prophets and in the New Testament. And great is their error, or rather their blasphemy. Abhor these and flee from them who blaspheme the Holy Spirit and have no forgiveness. Matthew chapter 12 verse 31 and 32. For what fellowship have you with the desperate, you who are now to be baptized into the Holy Spirit? If he who attaches himself to a thief and consents with him is subject to punishment, what hope shall all have who offends against the Holy Spirit? So you see, Another thinker in the early church, John Cassian, stated that Simon received saving grace, but in vain because he never repented in response to Peter's command. 
Uh, in Acts uh, chapter 8, we read about Peter's command, cha- uh, chapter 8, verse 22 and 23. And John Cassian says, The reception of saving grace was of no profit to Simon, doubtless because he had received it in vain. For he would not obey the command of the blessed Peter, who said, Repent therefore of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps he the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Well, in documents attributed to Clement of Rome, Clement records a debate in his recognitions between the learned Simon Magus and the Apostle Peter, who had little formal education. As we know from the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 13, he was just a fisherman. And this debate over some of Simon's teaching took place in Caesarea, as we can read in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 1 through 8. Let's read it in the book of Acts, chapter 10. Uh, the book of Acts, let me see, where is the, here is the Bible, all right. Uh, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 10. a bit slow with starting and but it's okay uh, book of Acts is it chapter 10 book of Acts chapter 10 verse 1 through 8 at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to, prayed continually to God. Uh, and, uh, uh, debate over some of Simon's teachings took place in Caesarea, and we see this here in Acts chapter 10 verse 1 through 8. A devout man who gave alms, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stated at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter, he is lodging with one Simon, a tender, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who, spo- uh, who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attend him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, The uh, there's some major points in some of the people you know present when when it comes to discussion of Simon the Magus and debate is an interesting expose of Simon's lies as he keeps getting cornered in one lie after the other he 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 changes the subject and moves on presenting a very slippery uh, a very slippery target indeed now. Zacchaeus, the former tax collector from the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 2, and later bishop of Caesarea and in Samaria, he wrote to James, the bishop of Jerusalem, requesting help in combating Simon. Simon had been subverting many people in Samaria, asserting that he was the Christ and the great power of the high God, which is, of course, superior to the creator of this world. And at the same time, Simon showed many miracles that made some doubt the faith and that made others fall away from the Spirit. Somehow, Simon grew and Simon knew of Peter's arrival without anyone telling him and he took the initiative and changed Peter to a public, challenged Peter to a public debate. Now, there were two former disciples of Simon named Nisete and Aquila, they had been converted to the faith by Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus advi- advised Peter 
regarding Simon's skills and methods and about his weaknesses. They felt that Simon might overmatch Peter. And before their conversion, Simon had told Niceta and Aquila that he had made a boy out of air and claimed that this was a much nobler work than God, God the Creator, when he made a man from the earth. And because he had done a work that was far more difficult, Simon claimed to be greater than God the Creator. Now, what Simon had actually done was, was create actually illusions. First he murdered a boy and then he used the boy's body as parts of his system of illusions to make it appear that the boy was alive. So that no one could actually catch him in his, in this trick, uh, he claimed that he spent the boy, he sent the boy back to the air. Niceta and Aquila advised Peter on this and this bit of information would become a key facet toward the end of the debate. Now, as the debate began, there were many supporters of Simon attending. Peter began the debate by addressing the people present, saying, Peace be to all of you who are prepared to give your right hands to truth and to walk in his public paths of righteousness. Peter then defined what righteousness is. You see, Simon refused Peter's concept of peace, preferring the peace that comes when two fight with each other, uh, when, uh, sorry, uh, when, when two, uh, when two fight with one another, then there will be peace when one has been defeated and has fallen. Now Peter countered by saying that truth should be sought for with quietness and order. Simon quoted Christ's words, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Those are Christ's words from Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Peter reminded Simon that Christ also said, Blessed are the peacemakers in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 9. Since Simon had been a follower of John the Baptist, it is not surprising that he knew what Christ had said, you see. The Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew had also, had also been in circulation for a while. Those, uh, those with the means could have ascribed copy. Peter, the apostle, challenged then Simon to define who is his God. Simon began by stating that the scripture says, the scriptures say that there are many gods. A God in the form of a serpent, he said. On the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall be as gods. That is written as a promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 5. Well, that actually means uh, as those who made men. Now, after they had tasted of the, of, the, of the tree, God himself testifies, saying to the rest of the gods, Behold, Adam is become as one of us. So he has become as one of us. It's recorded in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. One of the large, one of these gods, Simon said, was chosen to be the god of the Jews. And we notice something that Simon quietly, at least from what he's quoted, he was quoted, we learned. And, uh, we also notice that Simon quotes freely, freely from the law, meaning the first five books of Moses. Now, uh, 
I'm trying to think what would be relevant to say yet about this. Uh, oh, there are all these kinds of negative traditions, but to gain some respect in the face of the laughter, Simon stated that God, the Creator, was weak, and weakness was not compatible with a supreme God. He formed, he formed a man in the garden, but he couldn't keep himself as he intended. Now, of course, the, uh, of course, the, he was, he, he condemned man, man to death for eating in order to know good and evil, and cursed the serpent that he had shown man, man, that he shown man was man that, you know, uh, he has shown man these things, that he, yeah. And Simon continued that God the Creator's weakness is, is evident by looking at those evils which are done in this world and are not corrected. Either his Creator powerless if he cannot correct what is done amiss, or else if he does not wish to remove the evils that he is having a hate that he is himself evil. This law does not, doesn't know or teach. Doesn't know or teach anyway. The Apostle Peter responded anyway to this private interpretation of the law by saying that people who read the law without the instruction of masters tend to conceive absurdities such as these. If God, the Creator, is most important to me and evil, then Simon's power is also, since he does not correct those things which are done amiss, or if he can and will not, it is evil. Further, if people believe that Simon's power exists and it doesn't, then Simon's fraud is worse than the knowledge of a weak Creator. So, just in describing uh, his power, Simon copies and borrows, you know, terms from the uh, Church of God, uh, Church of God, or terms from God the Creator, such as, you know, light and substance and goodness, but this is not somehow new. Uh, Simon replied in his, rec- in his, uh, uh, What's the word in his uh, 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 argument? Let's call it argument with Peter. Simon replied, "Peter, don't you know that our souls were made by that good God, but that they have been brought down as captives to the world?" A typical Gnostic teaching, by the way. He sent God, the Creator, to make the world, and He, when He had made it, gave out that He Himself was God. Peter then cornered Simon in a logical inconsistency and said. Then he is not, as you said earlier, unknown to him who made the world, nor are souls ignorant of him, if indeed they were stolen away from him. The uh, uh, To whom then can it he be unknown, if both the creator of the world knows him as having been sent by him and would tell us, whether he who sent the creator of the world knew that he would keep faith. For if we did not know it, then he has no knowledge. While if he foreknew it and allowed it, he is himself guilty of this deed, since he did not prevent it. But if he could not prevent it, then he is impotent. Your good work is weak enough. For you say he is more powerful than all, but he who can believe the weaker of your gods wrenched the spoils from the stronger. And then Simon changed the subject, and again and again, to speak of all the visions he has had of heavenly places and how all these things have been revealing to him, Peter replied that people who are beginning to be possessed with a demon or to be disturbed in their minds, begin that they begin with similar visions. 
They are first carried away by fancies to some pleasant and delightful things, delightful things, and then uh, they are poured out by vain motions toward things which have no existence. For example, those who are in distress through, through thirst, when they fall asleep, seem to themselves to see rivers and fountains and to drink. But these are just mirages. Now, to debunk Simon's exalted claims, Peter said, if you can declare the thoughts of your heart to... uh, Where am I? The the text is gone. The the thoughts of your heart... I cannot. I cannot now see. The text has escaped me. The text text has escaped me. But anyway, cornered with contradiction, Simon Peter challenged Pe- Simon challenged Peter to explain what he thought was about the heavens. And Peter stated that the law teaches us about the heavens if we are willing to listen. Simon stated it is a great thing which you promise that the eternity of boundless light can be shown from the law. Simon then postponed the discussion until the next day, and abruptly left with about 1,000 of his followers. As the second day of the debate dawned, Simon presents that crowd had turned in Peter's favor. Now Peter explained uh, that the people are merely seeking the truth, but that Simon is a seducer and doesn't speak the truth. So Simon said, don't detain me with long speeches, just come through on your promise of yesterday. You said that you could not, that you could show that the law, that the law teaches concerning the immensity of the eternal light and that there are only two heavens and these created and that the higher is the abode of that light in which the ineffable Father dwells alone forever. After the pattern of that heaven is made this visible heaven, which you asserted is is to pass away, you said that the Father of all is one, because there cannot be two infinities. Since then you are able to show it from the law, Leave off, leave off other matters and set about this. Now, Brethren Peter also expressed concern that he would not just be throwing pearls before swine. You certainly remember that we are uh, uh, admonished not to do it in uh, the book of, I think it's the book of Matthew. Uh, not exactly. Now, then Peter said... See, my brethren, into what absurdity Simon has fallen. Before my coming, he was teaching that men have it in their power to be wise and to do what they will, but now, driven into a corner by force of my arguments, he denies that man has any power either of perceiving or acting. I know why you have spoken thus. You wished us to avoid inquiry, lest you should be, you should be openly confuted, and therefore you say that it is not in the power of man to perceive or, who, or to discern anything. But if, but if anything, if this had really been your opinion, you will not surely, before my coming, have, have professed yourself yourself for the people. Uh, to be a teacher. Well, Simon then began to contend contentious about everything Peter said in order actually to... Uh, why did he do it? In order to generate confusion and avoid being overcome by Peter's arguments. This animosity continued for the rest of the day where Simon changed his views on several matters, including a denying that evil exists and is accepting of fate. 
Sadly, again, in all this, but then we see actually elements of Gnosticism, the philosophy and religious system, theology system that subverted the early church from within and changed it completely in approach and in teaching. Simon changed the subject again and asked Peter about the heavens. Earlier, Peter had said that the visible heaven veils the invisible heaven beyond it and would be dissolved at the second coming. Someone asked why the visible heaven was made in the first place if it was going to be dissolved. Peter said that it was made for this present life to veil the abode of God so that only those with a pure heart might see into it. Peter liked Link likened this to the shell of an egg. It's necessary to be broken and opened that the, the chick might come forth. Now Simon replied that dissolving of the visible heaven is contrary to the law which states none shall see my face and live in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 20. Peter said that one must read the law according to the tradition of Moses and not according to the private interpretation. Angels who are spirits uh, they see God all the time. Uh, more so they see him alive. After the resurrection of the body man will be like the angels says Hebrews in Matthew 22. Sorry, says Jesus Christ in Matthew twenty two thirty, and will be able to see God and live. Jesus has said, Blessed are they of a pure heart, for they shall see God. He said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Now, after this exchange, Simon closed the debate for the, uh, for the day and left with only a few associates. All the rest stayed to listen to Peter. Peter, in turn, healed everyone who was sick or demon-possessed, and and they depend rejoicing. Then they depart rejoicing for having obtained the doctrine of the true God. Now Simon began the next day's discussion by challenging by challenging Peter on the immortality of the soul. Now Peter. Peter indeed laid the foundation for this his technology by first speaking on the on the righteousness and justice of God. Now Simon said many well doers perish miserably, and again say, say and again many let uh, evil evil doers uh, finish long finish long lives in happiness. And because of this, he rejected any notion of a judgment day. Now the Apostle Peter re- replied that it is just and uh, that it is just the uh, novice of uh, just the novice of uh, or or better said, uh, let me see. It just like the it is just this that convinces us there that there were. In fact, you know, uh, be a judgment day. Oh well. Uh, oh well, oh well. Let me see what else is uh, relevant. Oh yes, dispute between Simon and Peter anyway. Simon, uh, Peter asks which of the two can better persuade the an incredulous man, seeing or hearing? And Simon replied, seeing. Then Peter said, why then do you wish to learn from me by words. What, what is, what, what is, uh, proved to you by the sight? 
some of them said, I don't know what you mean. Peter tell you, if you do not know, go now to your house and enter in the inner bed chamber. You will see in, uh, in an image, you'll see in an image placed containing the figure of a murdered boy clothed in purple. Uh, ask him and he'll inform you either by hearing or seeing. For what need is there to hear from him if it if the soul is bo- if the soul is broken and so what is here to uh, uh, if you do know what image what image uh, uh, I speak of? Let us go. Let us go immediately to your house with ten other men, and of those who are here present. So, hearing that, Simon turned pale. Because if he denied it, he was afraid that his house will be searched on, oh, okay, or that Peter could expose him. But anyway, anyway, this This was seeking repentance. So, Simon turned pale if he denied it. He was afraid that his house would be searched so that Peter would expose him more openly and that all would learn the secrets of his heart and the secrets of his magic. Therefore, Simon, in pretense, mouthed words of repentance in front of the crowd and asked the asked to become Peter's disciple. But Peter addressed the, the crowd, You see, brethren, you see, brethren, Simon is seeking repentance. In a little while, you shall seek him returning again to his fidelity. For thinking that I am a prophet for disclosing this wickedness, which he supposed to be secret and hidden, he has promised that he will repent. But I spoke not by a prophetic spirit. What I said, I learned from some who once were his associates in his work, but have not have now been converted to our faith with things he did with things he did he did in secret. Therefore, I spoke. What I knew, now what I not for you. Now, when Simon heard this, he began to attack Peter with blasphemies, reproaches, and curses. In his tirade, he admitted the pretense of repentance in order to learn. Peter's secret of foreknowledge, launching into a speech intended to create a prior to for to force Peter to leave, Simon claimed that he was born of a virgin, that he was flown through the air from mountain to mountain, borne by angels. He was well. He was made one body with fire, he has made status, uh, state, uh, status move, he has made stars, anyway, he was made one body with fire. He has made statues move. He has made stones to become bread. These prove that he is the eternal Son of God. 
The one who sent you, in fact Christ, is a magician who couldn't deliver himself from the cross. Peter stood his ground, unmoved, and the crowds in indignation violently picked Samuel up and threw him out of the court uh, where the debate uh, where the debate was held. Now all this was spread in a perfect illustration of what the Apostle Paul wrote about the word of the cross. Simon represented the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of the world was unwilling to discover God. Therefore, Chrysostom said that God employed what seemed to be foolishness in expect the gospel to persuade men, not by reasoning, not, not, but by faith. For he believed on him that was crucified and buried, and to be fully persuaded that this person himself both rose again and sat down on high, this did not need wisdom nor reasoning but faith. For the apostles themselves, uh, it came, came, they, they have faith which came in not by wisdom but by faith, and surpassed the heathen wise men in wisdom and loftiness. This transcends all human understanding since they were uneducated fishermen, indeed. What else can we say? Well, this is what uh, Paul meant by destroying the wisdom of the wise in First Corinthians one nineteen and Isaiah twenty nine fourteen. And then, uh, having that in mind, Chrysostom, Chrysostom continued, The wise are not profited at all by wisdom, nor the unlearned injured at all by ignorance. For the shepherd and the rustic, uh, rustic will uh, more quickly receive this, pressing all doubting thoughts and, uh, and delivering himself to the Lord. In this way, then, he destroyed wisdom. Similarly, he made foolish the wisdom of the world. In First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, we read, Christensen stated in this way, He has shown wisdom to be foolish in regards to receiving the faith. For since they prided themselves on it, he lost no time in exposing it. For what sort of wisdom is it then, when it cannot discover the chief things that are good? Peter then addressed the crowd, saying that we should bear with wicked men patiently, knowing that God himself bears patiently with them right up until judgment day. From this viewpoint, Simon should be mourned over since he has become a choice vessel. vessel. Uh, oh no, he become a choice vessel for the evil one. Now Peter gave a benediction and instruction and uh, instruction instructed everyone to meet again the next day. That evening he said and Aquila asked Peter how Simon, as an enemy of God, could do such great miracles. Peter spoke at length about why God show allows this in order that the desire of people's hearts may be revealed through their choice of good and evil. By choosing evil People chose their own destruction in order to please the evil one. Peter's content, uh, contest that is with Simon was similar to Moses' contest with Pharaoh's magicians. Pharaoh had a choice. But, you know, what did he do? He just, uh, he, he just, uh, uh, you know, chose the magicians of his own free will. Now similarly those from among the nations that do not use some judgment sound uh, that do not use sound judgment and willingly follow Simon they may be made what's the word? They may be made manifest. But those who rightly distinguish science from science may be saved. This is quite an insight into the ways God moves in his creation. Let's read a bit more, dear friends, about this phenomena. 
Niseta said, in what respect did the Egyptians, the Egyptians sin in not obeying, in not believing Moses, since the magicians performed similar signs, even although they were done rather in appearance than in truth? Well, Peter replied that God has veiled the truth, but reveals it to those who faithfully allow him. The signs that Simon performs have been their purpose in exalting Simon, whereas the signs, whereas the, uh, the signs that Peter does are profitable to men and glorify God. In a way, as the next day dawned, a disciple of Simon came to Peter begging forgiveness. The day before Simon, uh, the uh, man help well man help and uh, during that helping that man well dumping was uh, let me see Oh yes, since he had the man help him dump in the ocean some of the implements used in his black magic, before everyone found out just what Simon really did. Simon then wanted him to leave his wife and young children and follow him to Rome. There Simon promised to please the people so much that he should be reckoned a god and publicly gifted with with divine honors. <coughs> Simon promised to make the man very wealthy, but the man had been had bad feet and couldn't comply, even if he wanted to. As Peter spoke to the crowds that day, he had the man himself to testify to everyone about what Simon had done. Peter resolved to follow Simon to Rome to prevent the Romans from being swallowed up first, uh, up first his evil. First, Peter ordained Zacchaeus, the former tax collector in Luke 19, verse 1, uh, as, uh, as a bishop of the church in Caesarea. Then Peter stayed with them for three months to confirm them in the faith. Now, John Christensen noted that Paul and the other apostles had the power and authority to punish people who were hopelessly entrenched in sin in order to try to save them, but they didn't like to use the power. Sometimes sometimes using this power was necessary, such as with Sapphira, that you might remember, and with Simon Magus. Paul and the other apostles preferred to be thought of as a weak by not having to use their power so long as their churches lived in repentance. Anyway, the Apostle Paul also wrote that uh, I pray to God in Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 7 I pray to God that you do not do evil not that we should appear approved but that you should do what is honorable though which though we may seem disqualified. This is in Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 7 now what does that mean? You see, he entreats God that he may find no one that has not repented. Not only this, but that not, uh, but, but that none may have sinned at all. Paul says that you do not do evil, but if you have sinned, then that you may have changed your conduct and may have been with me in reforming and stopping all wrath and consequence of your consequence of your deeds. I am not eager about punishment that we should be approved in this way, but exactly the opposite. If you should continue sinning and not repenting, it will be necessary for us to chastise, to punish, to maim your bodies as happened in the case of Sapphira and of Simon Magus, 
where we have given proof of our power. But we don't pray for this. But the contrary, we don't wish to be approved in this way, exhibiting the proof of the power which is in us by chastising and punishing you as sinning and as incurably deceased. But that you should do what is honorable, we pray for this, that you should always live in virtue, always repentance, and we may be may seem qualified, never displaying our power of punishing. We rejoice that we are weak and you are strong, and we pray for your perfecting. Most certainly we cannot do anything against the truth, that is, punish you if you are well-pleasing to God, because we cannot, we therefore do not wish it and desire the opposite. We are particularly glad when we find you giving us no occasion to show that power of our of our sort of punishment. Doing such things shows men to be glorious and strong still. We desire the opposite, that you should be approved and blameless, that we should that we should never reap the glory arising from that. Therefore he says, For we are glad when we are weak in second Corinthians chapter thirteen, verse nine. That is when we are thought to be weak, for they were thought to be weak by their enemies, because they didn't display their power of punishing. But still, we are glad that your behavior is such as to give us no pretense for punishing you. It's a pleasure to us to be in this way considered weak. Now Peter followed Simon to Antioch, because after Simon Magus left Caesarea, he began to speak evil about Peter, lying to people everywhere he went. Now this was documented in a letter from the brethren that had gone ahead detailing the crimes of Simon. But in those days a letter was received from the brethren stating that Simon had been going from city to city, deceiving multitudes, and everywhere maligning Peter, so that when he should come, no one might afford him a hearing. For Simon asserted that Peter was a magician, a godless man, injurious, cunning, ignorant, and professing impossible things. For he asserts that the dead shall rise again, which is impossible. But if any one attempts to confirm him, he is cut off by secret snares through means of his attendants. Wherefore also when I have triumphed over him, fled for fear of his snares, lest he should destroy me by incantations or ach- achieve my death by plots. <coughs> Peter first went to Tripoli, accompanied by Clement, Niceta, Aquila, and twelve others, stopping at Ptolemy's, Tyre, Sidon, and Beirut. <coughs> when Simon Magus heard that Peter had arrived in Tripoli, he left for Syria during the night. Meanwhile, a huge crowd thronged around Peter at the house of men named Maro, and Peter spoke to them in Maro's garden. Some Peter healed, and some he cast demons out of. Speaking at length, Peter explained how sin was the cause of mankind's suffering and the origin of idolatry and the means by which demons can get power over men. While the gospel is the solution to man's problems, the Lord has allowed pretenders using magic to come forward beginning with Ham, the son of Noah, and Mizraim, Ham's son, the father of the Egyptians, from whom Simon learned this his art. Peter encouraged the crowd to withdraw from the pollution of Simon's teachings and to be joined to Christ. So, another interesting part of, you see, uh, Christian history. Then, of course, Peter would leave Tripoli, and company moved up to the coast of Ortoasis and Antradaus, accompanied by a large crowd. So you see, when the crowds followed one of one of Christ's main, the Christ's main apostle, anyway. But we can talk about that next week, and we can continue to see this not much known history of one of the greatest opponents, the main, the arch opponents, the arch of all heresies against God's Church, God's original primitive Church, Simon Magus, brethren. Uh, yeah, I know it's a historical data, it may not be interesting to everyone, but it's interesting to see how the preaching of the gospel was opposed, how it was subverted, and eventually, 
the whole church was subverted by the false gospel and then uh, when we come to the second century and we take a look at what used to be the original church we were we are shocked we see nothing that resembles what Jesus Christ in instigating the twelve apostles nothing that resembles what the church was in Jerusalem originally when it was founded on the day of Pentecost in the first century.